Hey guys, Adam here with yet another punch-out repair. Boy, this has been a long time. I think the last repair I did was like two years ago. Uh, but anyway, this one comes to us from Bayman Coach over on the Claw Forums. And this is a standard punch-out. You can tell because it doesn't have the security daughter card that plugs in there, which would make it a super punch-out. And actually, I get a lot of questions from people asking me, Hey, can you turn my game into a super punch-out or how easy is it? Um, as far as reburning a set of ROMs, that's kind of trivial. That's not a big deal if you have a ROM burner or can get somebody to burn you the ROMs. The problem is getting that security card. Um, there's some tricks in there. There's some extra hardware, security hardware that that the super punch out uh, ROMs are looking for in order to run. And if that's not there, then it doesn't run. So unless you got that card, you can't make it a super punch out. But anyway, this game uh, I believe has issues, as you can see here. Uh, I'm not sure which screen that is, top or bottom, but if we flip to the other screen, you can see here, uh, even if I reset the game, let's see what happens. Yeah, so there's just, I don't know, there's nothing there. <laughs> a little, little something going on on the top and the bottom. Um, but I can see kind of a pulsing. I, you probably can't see it in the video, um, but it, there's something rhythmic going on, a periodic, especially over here. And to me, that just means that the watchdog's probably going off. I know there's definitely problems with the CPU board, um, and actually I'm, I'm thinking there's probably some major issues with the video board too, because even if the CPU board was dead, the the video RAMs that are sitting on these two boards are filled with garbage, right? And so even if this board was completely dead, that garbage would make its way out to the screen here, and you would just see a complete uh, you know, garbage all over the screen, all sorts of random characters and stuff like that. But the fact that we have this big cutout here, uh, that worries me a little bit, so... But anyway, let's dive into the CPU board first, because I'm pretty sure we have problems there, and then we'll see where, where that leads us. So the first thing I'm going to do is check the reset on the Z80, which is right there. There's my logic probe, so we'll grab him. And if I look over my shoulder, my little cheat sheet here, Z80 reset is pin 26. And so we're just going to say 21, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And you can see there that it's pulsing. And so the way the watchdog works is it's just a timer that should actually never go off if the program is running properly. Uh, as the program is running, it constantly resets that timer, okay? Um, if you go back in my previous videos, I, I kind of explain you know, how Watchdog works and, and whatnot, so go back and you'll kind of see that, but basically what this is telling me is that the program is not running properly. So there's something wrong where the Z80 can't access um, either a portion or all of the programs, uh, in, uh, all of the program, rather, that's in the program ROMs. And so the next thing I want to check is just the enables on these uh, ROMs to see if they're even pulsing at all. Um, if they're not, then chances are it's the address circuit, or circuitry rather that drives uh, these ROMs. So again, looking over my shoulder, I have a little cheat sheet here for all different size EEPROMs. And it looks like the output enable on a 2764 and 27128 is pin... Da, 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 what is that? 20... I'm sorry, I misspoke. It's the chip enable I'm looking for, not the output enable. The chip enable is pin 20. So let's go back here and let's see, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. That's high. Okay, so this guy's not being turned on. And it may not, right, depending on when the, or what, what portion of the program that the, uh, that's running right now when the Z80 fires up. Some of these chips may not get accessed. I'm just looking to see if any of them are getting accessed. Uh, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. Okay, so he's actually toggling, so that's good. 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. He's not. 20, he's not. 19, 20. And he is. He is a lot, actually. Okay. All right, so that's good. That means uh, my address circuitry is doing something. Um, so next step would be to verify these ROMs, make sure that there's uh, nothing sketchy going on with them. Um, I could throw them into my ROM uh, programmer slash verifier, this big beast here. But I have the Fluke, which can kind of do the same thing. Um, so why not just do that rather than have to pull all the ROMs out and everything. And so what the Fluke is going to do is I can, I can plug it in place of my Z80. I can take the Z80 out and use my Z80 pod, which is hiding down there. And basically this becomes the Z80, except I get to decide what gets read and, and what gets written. And so there is a function on the Fluke called the uh, ROM verifier, I guess, or ROM test. And what it'll do is it'll take, it'll start at the beginning of a ROM, and it'll read the value, and then add it to the next one, and add it to the next one, and basically just read all the values, add them all up, and do some kind of fancy math, and come up with a signature of some value 
um, that should be unique to that ROM. And so if you go um, if you go out and search for the ROM signatures for, for some of these ROMs, then you can then compare it and say, okay, uh, this is the signature I got. Does it match up with what I expect to see? And I've worked on so many of these boards over the years that, you know, I have paperwork here that I have, little cheat sheets and whatnot. And so this is my little cheat sheet that tells me for ROM signatures, this is the address range for a given ROM. This is the location of the ROM, and this is the signature. So I can just plug that pod into there, and we'll fire that guy up, and we can verify uh, these ROMs and see if they're all legit. So here we have, I took the Z80 out, you can see it right there, and I have my, my uh, Z80 pod uh, sitting in its place, and then I fired up the Fluke here. So what I want to do now is just a ROM test on, uh, we'll start off with uh, 8L, which is the first guy here, and his address range is from 0000 to 1FFF, location is 8L, the signature is 6079. So we're going to say, all right, let's do a ROM test. And what's the address range? 0, 0, 0, 0 to 1 FFF. And the signature is 6079. And what it's going to do now is it's going to sum up all the data in there. And there's probably something else that it's doing behind the scenes, some magic. And it's going to come up with its signature. And then we'll see if they match. All right, so it looks like it does not match. We got a ROM error in that range. And if we say more, it'll say the signature was actually 6DCB and not 6079. Um, so we do have a problem with that ROM um, or the, some of the circuitry that's driving that ROM. Now, um, I will admit that um, I already ran ROM checks on uh, most of these other guys, and they were all failing. And to me, that's very uncommon. I can see how... You know, you get bit rot on one of these guys, and you you know it ends up getting corrupted. But all of them, uh, that makes me wonder if there's a issue between the circuitry. Uh, I'm sorry, an issue in the circuitry between the Z80 and these ROMs. Uh, only way to be sure is to pull these guys and throw them in the uh, the ROM uh, programmer and uh, verify the contents. And so that's the next step. Things not looking so good from a ROM perspective. So here I have. Uh, this is actually an older data I/O. Uh, lab site, um, very old school, but it's worked faithfully for many, many years, um, and so I still use it. And this is, I believe, what do we got in here? This is 8F. So let's load up 8F, the data from uh, the MAME source here, the MAME ROMs. I got my punch out ROM set here from MAME. 8F, uh, I'm sorry, that's the back PCB. We want the CPU PCB. Uh, that's it right there. All loaded up, and so that's what that's what the data looks like in hexadecimal. And let's compare it to what's in the ROM. So if we click that there, it will verify to see if what's in the ROM matches that, and it does not. So very first address zero, the the device that is the one that's sitting over there in my uh, programmer. Uh, the data in address 0 is 2, but the data in the file from MAME is 0. Um, so there's definitely some sketchiness going on here, and I've checked uh, all the other ones too, and there's also some sketchiness. So these guys are bad. So I think what we're going to do is we're going to pull this guy out along with the rest of these here, and we're going to reprogram them. So first step in doing that is to erase them. And so if we, this is my little eraser that I have here. And we'll stick them on here like so. And then that way we can get them erased and reprogrammed. So what this will do is it'll hit, uh, it'll send UV light through these little windows here and that erases all of the contents and then we can bring them back to the programmer and program them. So uh, let's set this for about 15 minutes. Very old school. Turn it on. You can see the UV light. And so that is it. So let's come back when it's all set and we can uh, reprogram them. All right, there we go. That's what we want to see. Uh, so it looks like our ROMs are good to go. We reprogrammed them and whatnot. Uh, but we're still seeing some issues, as you can see. That's the top monitor, I think. And this is the bottom monitor. Nothing. Okay. So what do we do now? Well, I was poking around and I was taking a look at some of the RAM here. These two guys and this guy here. And I'm seeing all sorts of stuff. Uh, going on, which makes me think that there's something more um, 
because if all these guys were having issues and Rams now having issues, then it almost seems like there's a there's a main issue with either the addressing logic that surrounds the Z80 or the bus drivers that drive the data to, to each one of these guys. And so just kind of out of curiosity, I did some RAM tests. And I, again, I got my little cheat, he, cheat sheet here. So if I want to look at, say, the opponent video RAM, which starts at E000 to E7FF, we can say, you know, just arbitrarily, I'm going to write to E000. Uh, let's just pick a number 12. Okay, so it's saying I got a data error at that location, E000. Do you want a loop? Uh, I can press more here to get more info. Okay, so it's saying data bits at D8. And so what that means, let me grab my little piece of paper here. Uh, when it says something like D8, so what is D8? D8 in hex is really, well, what's D in binary? D is a 1101. And eight is one zero zero zero. So th these are my eight data bits. Okay, if you look at like the CPU here and stuff, you'll see it's got eight eight bits of data that are pouring out. So these are the eight bits. It's saying these four guys here I cannot drive. Okay, I'm trying to drive them to a certain value, and then when I read them back, they're corrupted. Okay, the ones that are zeros are fine, but the ones that are set here, these these four ones, um, I'm not able to drive. Does that make sense? And so, if it can't drive them, then there could be something else on the bus that's corrupting it, you know? Um, or it could be just this guy right here, this 7F, that could, that could be problematic. So, I think what I'm going to do is, rather than pull this guy, just to be on the safe side, I'm going to hook up the logic analyzer and just take a peek and see what's going on. I want to confirm that, you know, what, uh, what I see is, in fact, what the fluke is seeing before I go ahead and yank that guy. So, let's fire up the logic analyzer and we'll just take a peek real quick. You know what, before I throw the logic analyzer on here, there's one more thing I should check, which totally escaped me just because I haven't been doing this in so long. Um, I should probably just probe around and make sure that, there's the, that the signals are toggling and whatnot, that nothing's like pegged high and low. Um, I actually went through and looked at some of the data lines, and I actually found, uh, well, I started looking at other lines as well, control lines, like chip enable, write enable, those kind of stuff, and I found something that's kind of sketchy. So... Um, according to the schematic here, 8C is the guy we're looking at. Um, chip select is pin 20, and write enable is pin 27. Now, in order to write to this guy, we have to select the chip, and that's what's done by chip select. So that signal has to be a low. That's what the bubble indicates. And if we want to write to it, then the write enable has to be low, and that's what that little bubble indicates. And so if we're reading from this guy, we can just have chip select be low, and write enable can be high. If we want to write to it, Chip select has to be low, write enable has to be low. So anyway, I have this guy looping, okay? We're trying to write to this guy. So I'm just going to probe around chip select and write enable. It's pin 20 and 27. Uh, let's see, this guy right here. Oh, helps when I point the camera where you can see it. So 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. So that is my chip select, and that's toggling. That's good news. 27 is one down from the top. That's 28, it's VDD. And there's 27. So look, 27 is pegged high all the time. So even if I'm trying to write to it, even if you know the fluke is trying to write to it, or if the if the Z80 was plugged into it and trying to write to it, it's just not happening. So what do I do? Well, I got to start here at this write enable and work my way back, just like I've shown in my other videos. So this write enable is actually just tied to all these RAMs. They're all sharing the same write enable, and that's okay. They can do that because their chip enables will be unique. You can see each chip select comes from a separate chip. So the write enables all go together, and it looks like they feed down. I'm sorry, where am I? Uh, it's hard to hold the camera and do this at the same time. So it goes all the way over to this circuitry right here. Uh, looks like it actually feeds off of, hold on, let me see if I got this right. Uh, write enable comes down to this guy right here, which is a NAND gate. It's an AND with a little inverter on the end of it. And it gets its input from memory request and memory write. So let's start with these guys, uh, and we'll work our way over. So memory write should be pulsing, and it's pin 11 of 6D, and the output is pin 10 of 6D. So let's find 6D here, right here. So the output is, I'm sorry, the input, pin 11. 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. So this is the pin that's coming from the CPU. So the CPU, I'm sorry, the fluke in this case, because right, my fluke pod's plugged in. So I'm trying to write to it. That's the input. The output ah, is pegged low all the time. There's a little bit of corrosion. Let me break through that. It's low all the time. So the fluke is trying to write to it, 
and it chip ain't having it. It's just internally shorting it to ground. So this guy is bad. And so what is this? It's a 74 LS04, which I have a ton of. So I'm going to pull this guy out, and I suspect we'll see a lot more life out of this thing. So we have our new 74, what is it, 74 LS04 in place there. Nothing yet. Uh, let's see if we can write to that RAM. Write to E000, one, two. Okay, awesome. All right, so we're getting closer. Uh, I suspect if I do run this guy, yeah, so we're still not getting anything. Uh, let me flip over here to the screen, nothing. Okay, so there's still something that's not quite right. Um, so why don't we go a step further and we'll do RAM tests on all these RAMs and then we'll see if we can uh, get anywhere. So let's start with the first one here. Uh, this is just regular user RAM. This is D000 to D7FF. So we're going to do a RAM short test D000 to D7FF. And what this is going to do is that there's some kind of algorithm. I don't know what it is. Um, but it writes and then reads back different values and all the different entries of the RAM um, based on this range from D000 to D7FFF, the D7FF. And then um, it'll, the, the way the algorithm works is it can identify uh, based on the patterns that it's writing and reading if any of the address bits are tied or uh, any of the data bits are tied together and that kind of stuff. And then it, and it just allows you to really hone in on uh, what bits may be, may be the problem. So let's go ahead and run this guy. Okay, already, boom. So it, it started at D000 and it worked up to D038 and it's saying bits EE are bad. So that's like what, six out of the eight bits are bad? Um, so that's not good. Now it says rewrite is okay. Ah, see that? It's like sporadically coming up with a fail here. Let's do that RAM test again, I'm just curious. D000 to D7. FF. And now it's actually going through, okay, okay, so we got further. D274 bits EE, same bits, loop. And if I say loop, now it's saying it's fine. But see that? That's like glitching out every once in a while. So there's something else on the line, or maybe it's a control signal that's sketchy. Uh, I suspect there's noise on it or something like that. And so what I may actually have to do, and I've seen stuff like this before, is actually grab my logic analyzer because uh, this has an oscilloscope, so I would leave it in oscilloscope mode, start probing around some of these control signals and see what's going on. Something doesn't look right. All right, so RAM checks are looking good. Actually, the problem was just uh, here. This is kind of the only way I can get the fluke pod to connect with that socket is through this wire wrap connector here, and it was just a little sketchy. So anyway, uh, RAM checks are good. ROM checks are good. Let's fire this guy up. And okay, so we're seeing some signs of life. We can see the Punch-Out logo, although it's very sketchy, is trying to display there the other monitor as well. This to me, I'm not sure if this is the upper or lower. Let's wait. Okay, so this looks like it's probably the upper monitor. Uh, I forget. I forget which one the little guy is. I think it looks like the outline of the little guy with the boxing gloves. So I'm not sure, but um, anyway, there's a ton of stuff missing here. There's characters that are missing, there's opponent sprites, player sprites, everything's gone for the most part. Um, I can see a little bit, okay, so this has got to be the lower monitor because I can start to see, you know, stuff moving here. This is actually a good sign. Um, the fact that there's nothing here makes me think, okay, this is actually the lower monitor, there's the, there's the green guy. Um, makes me think that this is actually an issue on the back PCB. And so the way this works is, do I have a copy of the back PCB around here somewhere? I should have one somewhere, shouldn't I? Here we go. Oh, all this mess. So let's pull out our back PCB. And so this handles all, uh, not all, but, but most of what's getting displayed on the upper monitor, the background sprites and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then in addition, what's down here is a connector from the middle PCB. And the middle PCB handles all of the opponents and the player sprites, okay? So its job is to render all the, the fighting that's going on. And then this little PCB does the background, okay? The boxing ring and the, the, the audience and that kind of stuff. And then they get merged right here, okay? So the fact that I can't see anything, okay? I can barely, no, well, I can't see anything. For, for, for a brief moment, I can see little glitches or whatever, but that, that's nothing. 
um, tells me that there's probably an, uh, an issue here. Um, and I really don't know what it is yet, but this is the area that I think you know is, is probably bad. Either that, or it could be um, uh, something global, like a clock that's bad. Actually, now that I think about it, that, that could be very well it right there. Um, because there's clocks that get generated to drive all the pixel information um, from the different PCBs out to the screen. And uh, the clock that drives the CPU PCB could be very different uh, than the clock that drives uh, these other PCBs. In fact, in most cases it is. They may use that as a starting point. It'll take this crystal here, it'll generate a clock for the CPU, and then it'll divide it down or whatever to get slower clocks that are needed to, to drive the, uh, the video. And so it could be very well something in the clocking logic. Um, but we'll have to flip this guy over and start probing, and then uh, we'll see what we find. Something interesting I just noticed. So there's the the fighter. You can kind of see a sketchy outline, but look at what happens when I switch to the top screen. See that? Bottom screen, top screen, bottom screen, top screen. So what's what's going on is that some of the player sprites are actually getting sent to the upper monitor. Now that's never supposed to happen during gameplay. That does happen during the splash screen. Uh, you notice, like when you reboot the thing, you'll see that. And if I switch to the upper monitor, you can see the same thing. And so there's logic at uh, the very end of the back PCB. Uh, where is it? Right here. And so, uh, make sure I read this correctly. Where is it? Yeah, yeah, actually, it's this guy up here. So this is the lower monitor. This is the upper monitor. This MUX, okay, allows data to be sent from this logic over here, right, which is the, you know, your health bar and all that kind of stuff. That's all generated by this. Or you can take the information that is sent from the middle PCB, the player and the opponents and all that stuff, and send them also out through the top. The only time that that is turned on is when those logos are coming up the screen like that. And so uh, this will be set, and then that logo will pour through here and be displayed on the lower screen, and it will also be sent up and sent through the upper screen. And so something's going on with this here. Um, the fact that... Uh, I'm seeing so much sketch sketchiness also on the lower monitor, though. makes me think that maybe it's not a problem with this MUX, but rather the control signal that's driving it. And maybe as I trace that back, I'll find out the control signal that's also driving this is flaky. I'm not, no, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm just kind of, you know, talking as I, as I look through this. Um, but I'm going to start digging into that. I'll start with this guy here, actually. Look at this select for him. Actually, can I do that now? Uh, I can do that now. I have my logic probe already hooked up. Let's see, that's pin, what is it, pin 1 of 6K? Where is 6K? He is 8K, 5K, I'm sorry, 6K right here. Pin 1. No, he's toggling, so he is doing something. There's so much corrosion on some of these pins. 6K, he's doing something. What about... Where's the selects for these guys? Uh, 14 and 2 of 8K. So 8K is way up here. This is pin 2. He's toggling. 16, 14. And he's toggling. Okay. So, oh well. I was hoping to find something really cool to catch a camera, but guess not. So I'm going to have to dig into this a little bit further. <clears throat> figure out what's going on. But something about the muxing here does not look right. Well, I checked out the clocking on the video PCB. Actually, the back PCB and the video PCB. Everything looks fine. Um, so then I kind of went back to the schematic. Looked at uh, this area where I figure the problem is. Checked out the muxing and stuff like that. That looked okay. And then the final stage in the logic is this section of PALs here. Um, these are the color PALs, I'm sorry, color PROMs that let the colors go out to the screen. And I noticed a chip select here that basically turned these guys on. So I grabbed my probe and I checked them out and sure enough it was low. Now that, that doesn't seem right to me because if it's low all the time, then what's the purpose of ha even having that signal? Um, and of course, if it's low all the time, these guys are enabled, and I should be seeing colors on the screen, and I don't see, I see pretty much nothing. Uh, every once in a while, a little glitch, but that's it. And so just out of curiosity, I grabbed a pin and tied it to ground, and all of a sudden, boom, everything came to life. Well, not to life, but you'll see in a second. So I figured, well, what the heck? My, my probe said it was low, and then I'm grounding it, which is low, and all of a sudden it changes. So out of curiosity, I hooked up my uh, scope to it, my digital scope, and you can see here that, you know, it's low enough. Uh, let me see if I can kind of illustrate what's going on here. So this little mark right here, I don't know if you can see it in the camera, that is like two and a half volts. 
And so this pro basically says anything below two and a half volts is a logic zero. Anything above two and a half volts, it's a logic one. So sure enough, this is below two and a half volts. So when I put my probe on it, the light goes out. But really, that might not be low enough for the TTL part, actually the the uh, the prom here. And so when I drive this guy low, uh, let me look over my shoulder here. So I have a I have a wire hooked up here. When I pull this to ground, watch what happens to this signal here. See how it drops, and then look at that. Okay, so we got our player back. The opponent is kind of sketchy, and we'll get to that. Um, but look at the difference. So again, I'll let it go. Everything's gone, and then everything's back. Okay, so there's definitely something going on with that with that gate. And if I trace it back, uh, let's see, this guy here, trace it back. 74LS04 again with the same the same part this 74LS04 and I'm looking at these uh, these guys here and they're kind of funky looking they're not like the 7404s that I've seen in the past nice hard edges you know made by like Fairchild and TI this is like a generic I don't know what this is a 7404 and there's another one over here that kind of looks funky and so I don't know if it was a bad batch or something um, but that guy here is bad. He's just not driving it low enough uh, for the proms to uh, to be enabled. Another thing I noticed, just out of curiosity, has nothing to do with this, but this is the first time I've ever seen proms, I'm sorry, ROMs, actual ROMs being used um, on Punch-Out. All the other versions of Punch-Out that I've seen, they're actually EPROMs with a little sticker on there. This is actually stamped CHP1-B, uh, 2A, I'm sorry, 4A, and 4B. So I mean, these are actual Nintendo, you know, programmed ROMs, um, but I've just never seen them. I've always seen EPROMs. So anyway, long story short, let's get rid of this guy, um, and that should bring quite a bit of stuff back to life. Um, and then that way we can tackle. I'm sure we have um, opponent sprite issues, which is on the middle PCB here. But let's first get rid of this guy. Let's see some life with the logo. I'm sorry, the splash screen. Uh, the character there, the fighter guy, and then we can start working on the opponents. Okay, we got that guy replaced right there. Let's fire this guy up. Alright, so let's flip screens here. If I can get my hand underneath the switch. Awesome! So that I believe is the bottom, and that's the top. And cool, so we got some scorage. And we got our Hall of Fame. But I do see some little glitching going on up top, though. Do you guys see that? A little bit of twinkling there. Something going on. Oh, okay. Well, we're getting close, but starting to see some gel bars forming and whatnot. So we are close, but we're not quite there yet. How's the bottom look? Good. Looks pretty good. I do see a little bit of glitching down over here as he moves around. See that little speck right there? And so, there's still a little bit there, but we are very close. Um, as I look at this, if I were to take a guess, I would say it's probably in the pixel shifting logic. So, these guys are broken up into 8x8 eight eight pixel blocks. And uh, as they're being kind of digested and spit out to the screen, it kind of chops them up. And so when I see bars like that, usually it's an indication that something with the shifting logic is not working right. Or uh, the ROMs themselves are, have some issues, whatever. But but anyway, yeah, we are getting very close. So I just need to tackle that, and I'm pretty positive that is also on the back PCB because upper monitor issues are almost always have to do with the top PCB here because that's what drives it. So let me dig into that, and then we'll uh, we'll see where we go from there. So sure enough, I checked the serialization logic right here that takes all the bits from the graphic ROMs and spits them out one at a time. And that was looking sketchy. And this MUX here was looking sketchy too. So I placed the, both of those guys right here. And there we go. So that's looking a lot better. Um, I am seeing a little bit of glitchiness like you can see it up here in the top. Um, I'm noticing a wave in my camera, so I'm not sure if you guys can pick it up. But every once in a while, I'm, I'm seeing a little bit of uh, sketchiness, some artifacts up on the screen. And so that's going to be a little tricky to, to try to identify. Hopefully, as the board warms up here, it'll get much worse, and it'll be very easy uh, to figure out what it is. But cases like this where it's just like, you know, random stuff kind of twinkling around, that, that can be a real pain sometimes to chase down and figure out. So 
I'm just going to let this sit for a little while and we'll see if it worsens. So finally took care of those little graphics glitches. Man, what a pain tracing it down. It actually came from the CPU PCB of all things. Um, somewhere in the DMA circuitry. Basically what, what this, this board does is it's got individual RAM for you know, all the graphics. And it dumps all that information. You know, the CPU is, is doing what it's doing. It's dumping graphical information into these RAMs. And then uh, there's a DMA circuit that actually takes all that information and throws it onto the other boards uh, into various RAM and whatnot so that the CPU board can continue to work on other things. So it's kind of like um, you know, throwing some work off to, to the side so these boards can work on it while the CPU has got other things it needs to attend to, like sound and all sorts of other garbage. But anyway... Remember in the beginning we replaced that, uh, what was it, LS, uh, the 7404? Um, every single 7404 on this board I replaced. I was probing them um, because some of them were used in the, uh, in the DMA circuitry, like that guy there and that guy there. And sure enough, I saw sketchiness on all those guys. And so, you know, I just pulled them all off, replaced them all. You can see there's one there, there, and there. Um, and then everything came to life. So I think we are all set here. Looking good there, and we'll let it play through a little bit so I can make sure I don't have any graphics glitches. I believe that's the upper monitor. There's the lower monitor there. You can hear the sound. That's looking good. This is looking good. I don't know if you guys remember, we saw some glitching up in here, and I think in this corner up there. Yeah, and we definitely saw glitching up in here and over in here, and all that looks good. So while we got the board powered up here, let's let's make sure. Actually, there was also some glitching down there, if I recall. But this is looking good. Um, let's fire it up. Let me make sure that I got my uh, sound working here for both uh, speech and music. So let me see if I can remember what the pins are here. I think it's pin eight on that guy here. There we go. All right. So I was saying, go ahead and da 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 da. Uh, let's see, it should be this one here, 20, 19, 18, 17, and it's counting down, and then I should be able to switch the audio over and we can hear the speech. We'll switch it over. Ladies and gentlemen, there we go. Last go. Uh, fight. Awesome. So yeah, man, what a challenge. This board had all sorts of problems. Um, but I think we're in good shape. And the other issue, or not the other issue, but the other board set that uh, Bayman Coach sent me to look at was this guy here. Now, I don't know what happened to this board set. Let me see if I can get close enough for you to see it. There's all sorts of corrosion and sketchiness going on here. Um, so I asked him about it. Chips were actually like breaking off. You can see the legs and stuff. He was saying that this was found in some garage and it's been sitting there idle for, I don't know, 20 years since 1989. Um, I really don't know. <laughs> I mean, I've seen some corroded boards and whatnot due to like the battery leaking. But this is like, I think this is just due to moisture. This has just been in a damp environment for a while. Um, so I really don't know if I can bring this guy back to life. I mean, I really love the idea of the challenge, you know, bringing a board back to life that hasn't been alive since 1989. But as you can see, there's just so much going on with this board. Uh, but we'll see. I mean, I'll throw it up and, and take a stab at it. But uh, I'm not feeling too optimistic. But, you know, we'll see. Time will tell. But anyway, I think that's going to do it for this one, man. What a long repair. Probably the longest repair I've ever done on a Punch-Out. All sorts of problems ranging from every single PCB in the stack. So, But anyway, I think we're good. So we're going to call this one a success. And uh, I guess that is it. God bless you guys. I will catch you on the next one. Uh, let's see, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29. And that is low all the time, which means this guy is stuck in reset. I'm sorry, that's ground. <laughs> let's try this again. Actually, uh, is it this guy here? Yeah, it's stuck low all the time. Okay, which means it's actually, is that supposed to be stuck low all the time? You pin, uh, what is it, 13, the enable, and sure enough, that guy's low. Then what I did was 
I took, um, actually I'm trying to remember why I did this. Uh, the ROMs, which basically selects, um, or detects, uh, what did uh, what I want to say? <laughs> okay, moment of truth here. I think we have it. Oh. <laughs> Great. Alright. Moment of truth here. I think we have it. No, still sketchy, huh?